on my own to uh, prove this, and I keep getting stuck as I point as I showed you with uh, the square root and how to avoid the square root. So I'm going to try something different right now. Rather than figuring out on my own and then uh, showing it to you, um, I'm going to show you. We're going to go through a proof together. This is a proof that I haven't seen, so we're going to read it together and then try to make sense of it uh, as we as we go. So first, I have my computer here, and I'll switch back and forth between the view. But right here, I have uh, the Walter Rudin book, Principles of Mathematical Analysis, and this is the one that we have been loosely following for a while. So uh, it goes through the axioms, the field axioms, the ordered fields, and so on. And then at the end is construction of the real numbers. Okay. So we've been going through this loosely. I've been, cha I've been making changes to it, but uh, this is basically what we're following. And so here we are with the multiplication. And this is what I showed you before, where right here, I just showed you in the last video, he says, the proofs are so similar to the ones given in detail in step four that we omit them, which is not true at all. They're not, they're not similar for reasons that I've talked about. So he says at the end that he based his proof on books by Landau and Thurston, cited in the biography, and then also a book by, by Knopp or Knopp, and then uh, here the, the cuts were invented by Dedekind in, 19, in 1872. And Cauchy sequence is another way of do it, to do it due to Cantor. Okay. What we're going to do is I have Landau's book. So we're going to try to see, we're going to try to follow what Landau did to prove multiplication because he actually goes through it. So here is Landau's book, Foundations of Analysis. So we're going to try to follow Landau's proof of the multiplication axioms for Dedekind cuts and see if we can uh, work our way through it. So Landau constructs the cuts in a very different way from what I've done following Rudin. So it'll, this will be interesting to see if we can, it, it, how hard this is. So I haven't read this yet. Uh, I'm... I just found it and then I thought this would be fun to do together. So we'll do that and see if we can if we can get through it. So here's the table of contents. This looks like a cool book because he starts with natural numbers, then he describes fractions, and then he gets up to cuts. And so this is also interesting. I'm not sure what this is, but he has a chapter on cuts then a chapter on real numbers and multiplication of real numbers. But he has multiplication of cuts up here, which I think is what we want to prove. Um, let's just look at 84 for a second, and then we'll go to 54 and try to work through that proof. So 84 and then 54. Okay, so... I think I know what this is about. I think this is the same thing that, if you remember in our proof, we had to start with only looking at positive numbers. And then after the positive numbers, it's a separate step to, uh, to fill in the blanks. Because uh, remember I showed, I, I talked about how if you have a number line and one here and you have uh, alpha here, say this is two, and you want to multiply 2 and 3, say this is 3, then the problem with, we can't do negative, we can't do negative numbers. Actually, this should be 0. We can't do negative numbers because in, in this cut for alpha, there's a 4 here, a minus 4, and there's a minus 5 over here in uh, beta. So minus 5 times minus 4 is 20, which is clearly way outside what the real answer to 2 times 3 is. So we have to do this in a different way. We have to look just at the addition or just at positive numbers first, and then we add to and then we add in 
how to deal with negative numbers later. So I think that that's what this is about. Because uh, see, he's saying um, if one is greater than zero, the other is less than zero, or they're both less than zero, and so on. So we don't need that because we can do that with root. And so let's go back up here to 54, and we're going to try to work through this. Okay. So first of all, the very first thing you notice is he's using Greek letters as cuts, but he's using psi and eta rather than alpha beta. So those are just an odd choices to me. I don't know. So we're going to switch that to alpha and beta. But then the set of all rational numbers, which are representable in the form x, y, where x is a lower number for psi and y is a lower number for eta, is itself a cut. So first of all, I need to show you that uh, I did look up what he meant by lower number and upper number. He defines them, he defines cuts a little differently than, than we do. He says, let me change pens. He, he basically puts a cut, just say this is two. He puts a cut in the middle of the rational numbers. And then he says that a cut is actually two sets of numbers. There's the ones that are below and the ones that are above. So he thinks of a cut as the whole thing. What we're looking at is that only this is the cut and this is just not part of the cut. So he means that the things below the number are lower cuts, are lower numbers, and the ones above are upper numbers. So when he talks about uh, that psi uh, is a lower number for x and y is a lower number for n, or for eta, what he means is that there are, we're gonna call this two cuts, alpha and beta, and we'll, go, we'll stick with x and y. So we'll say that x is an element of alpha, y is an element of beta. Okay, so that's where we are so far. So, um, so then the set of all rational numbers which are representable in the form x, y, where x is, a, is an element of alpha and y is an element of, of beta, is itself a cut. So it's an element of R, as we would say. So that's what this theorem is. We've already proved, we've already proven that. So we're done proving that, that alpha beta is a cut. And what we, what we need to prove is the axioms. So what he does here is he's proving, he's going through what we've already done, that um, See like here uh, the property one for our cut. So he's proving the he's proving the properties of the cuts. What makes it a cut? So he's finished that. Um, we don't need to look at that carefully. And then here he says definition. So uh, psi times eta is multiplication. That's the cut. Uh, okay. So now he does the commutative law, which we've proven. That was easy. He does the associative law, which we've done. That's easy. Uh, I forgot. Is that zeta? Um, that one's easy. The distributive law we're going to do a little later. And now, now he proves ordering before he does anything else. So he's proving that either one is larger than the other or they're equal. That's something we're going to do when we get to... Uh, to or we're gonna prove the ordering on the set a little later. So we're gonna skip that. And this is more of more of the ordering rules. And then more of the ordering that if they're both, I think he's saying that if they're both greater than you multiply them together and they're greater. Um, so for any given rational number R, Oh, this is an interesting theorem that we touched on. For any given rational number r, the set of all rational numbers less than r constitutes a cut. 
a few videos ago, I talked about this, that we, we did a lot of talking about, we did a lot of talking about cuts. We did a lot of talking about cuts without ever mentioning numbers. These are just sets of rational numbers without having, associating it with anything. And then if you remember the first time that we had to associate a cut with a number, a specific number was when we defined zero star to be the set of all uh, P less than zero. And we said that that is our, is, is O, O star. So that was the first time that we had to associate an actual number with a cut. Then we've done the same thing again with one. And we've shown that one is a cut. So he does this a little different because he actually proves to begin with that for any given rational number r, the set of all rational numbers less than r constitutes a cut. That's an interesting way of doing it. It's something that we don't, that we don't need. We're not, it hasn't come up yet and we're not going to need to do this before in order to prove that the cuts form uh, you know, a field with least upper bound, an ordered field with least upper bound property. So we're going to skip that. The cut is constructed, is denoted by r star. Oh, this is very similar to what we have as zero star and, and one star. He's saying that for any rational number, you put a star after it, that denotes the, the cut. So, you know, two thirds star means the cut that has uh, two thirds as its uh, least upper bound. Okay, the next theorem is that psi times one equals psi. Now, this we've also proven. And finally, theorem 152, we get to the part that we are having trouble with. Let me change this, switch the page. Now, okay, so for any given equation, for any given Okay, so this is M5 multiplicative inverse uh, for any given cut alpha. The equation alpha beta equals one star has a solution uh, he says that's a, I think that's supposed to be a new oh I see ha, has a so oh, oh oh I'm sorry this was alpha this was Xi nu not Xi eta I don't know why he changed there so Xi nu equals one so it has a solution has a solution beta. Okay. So we're just proving the way we said it before was that for any alpha, there exists a beta in R such that alpha times beta equals uh, one star. Okay. So proof. Consider the set of all numbers Okay, I'm not, I'm, let's see if I need to write it down. So consider the set of all numbers. Yeah, consider the set of all numbers 1 over x where x may be an upper number for alpha. Ooh, this is this is uh, tough. Okay, accepting only that the least upper number, if such a one exists, we will show that this set is a cut. So he's saying, okay. 
So we've already gotten farther than this too. So remember, he's saying that X may be, he hasn't named it yet. Oh, an upper number for alpha, right? For alpha. So what he's saying is that if X is an upper number of alpha, that means that, that uh, X is not an element of alpha. So he's saying, if we have alpha here, he's saying that X is an upper number. So X is over here somewhere. X is not in, in alpha. That means that one over alpha, one over X, oh, whoops, sorry. That means that one over X is in alpha. That's what he's saying here. And then he's a little funky about the, about the least upper bound. Um, so, okay, so he's not looking at, so we will show that this set is a cut. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part because we've already, we've already done this too. We showed that beta is a cut. That was in the last video. Where, so what we have to do now is show, uh, move on and show that in fact, in that case, alpha beta equals one. Okay. So moving on. Okay, so, so he's just saying, this is just, this is uh, property one, that um, he's showing that it has something and he's showing that it doesn't have everything. That's the first one. Uh, and then he's showing property two, that if there's something less than that, then that's also gonna be in the cut, um, in the set. And then he shows that if you have something a little bigger, it's gonna be in the set. So we've done this already. So our set is therefore a cut. Let it be denoted by new, I think that's supposed to be. Okay, let's turn the page again. Now I think we're finally at the proof. We will now show that it satisfies alpha beta equals one star. Alpha beta equals one star. So we're gonna show that our beta, we showed it's a cut, now we're gonna show that alpha times beta is one star. This is where we got stuck. To prove this, it suffices to establish the following two statements, that every low number for EV is less than one, and that every rational number less than one is a low number for EV. Okay, we've already showed part A too. We get right to the end of this proof before we have trouble. So uh, we have already shown that one, which is that, um, that alpha beta is a subset of one. Now where we're stuck is showing that, so we've done this part. Now we have to show that every element of one star is an element of alpha beta. Once we've shown this, then we will have shown that if these are a subset of this and this is a subset of this, then alpha beta has to equal one. Okay, we've already done this part, so this is what we're on now. So one is a subset of alpha beta. Okay, as regards B, let U be less than one. In other words, we would say let P be less than one, um, or P is an element of one star. I'm not sure if we're gonna have to keep track of that. Let's just say that for him, U equals P. Choose any lower number, choose any lower number x for psi for alpha. Okay, I'm gonna make, let's make this r. Q. 
keep it a little more. Okay, so uh, we're choosing r less than one r. Uh, so r is an element of one. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Let let r. <laughs> that's messy. R less than one. Let r be any number less than one, rational number less than one. So choose. He says, choose any number, any lower number x for psi. So that means choose p element of alpha. And then by theorem 132, we're going to have to look up what that is. I hope we don't have to do this very much, but 132. Given any a and given a cut, there exists a lower number such that u minus x equals a. So, so we have a cut. And given any a, given any a, he's saying, just pick one. I don't know. There exists a lower number x and an upper number u such that u minus x equals a. But this looks like, I think this is the Archimedean property. I don't know why he doesn't, he didn't seem to label it that. Because look at what he says here. If by theorem 115, we have a suitable, oh no, that, that's the, 115 must be the Archimedean property. So this is obviously true, because certainly if this is zero, then we've already shown that if uh, there's an x here, there's gonna be a, it has an inverse. And so if we move that up, if we just add, if this is something if a does not equal zero, let's say a is positive, is bigger than zero, then if this is just x plus a, and this is u plus a, they're both gonna be on opposite sides, you just shift them over. So, okay. We have that, I, I, let's not bother to prove that, but um, I mean, I think that that's, would be easy to see. Um, what I, I think we probably have shown something like this, but we but we could if we if we want to. Okay. So there exists. So by theorem, so we've picked p. So we have p here somewhere, and p is inside the cut. A lower number, I was thinking that I would, it would be easier to change it into the language that we've already been using, but maybe it would be better to just use his language. It'll require less translating, even though it's gonna be less familiar. So let's start this over. So we have that u is less than one, okay? And then we have x, is an element of uh, psi. So, okay, so we have that x here, psi here. And then he says that a lower number x1 for psi. Oh, he might have said a little more than that in 132. Oh, it's saying a little more than this. I guess we I guess we have it, but the point of this theorem of 132 is that whatever the number is, there's going to be 
one number inside the cut and another number outside the cut that if you add them together, you will get, or if you subtract the lower from the upper, you'll get this number. So it's saying a little more than just that there's numbers on either side. It's saying more specifically that no matter what the number is, there's going to be one number inside the cut and one number outside the cut. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. So we have, let me go back. Okay, so we chose an X inside Xi, and then we're gonna pick a lower number X1 for Xi, and an upper number X2 for Xi. So then X2 has to be outside of Xi over here somewhere, such that x2 minus x1 equals 1 minus u x. Okay, where did this come from? Now, u is less than 1. So if, if u is less than 1, then if we move u over, we have that 0 is less than 1 minus u, right? u minus u, 1 minus u. So this is positive for what that's worth. But then didn't we say that x... Okay, we have to read 132 one more time. Given any A and given a cut, given any A and given a cut, there exists a lower number X and an upper number U such that they, you subtract them and they equal A. So what I'm finding odd So we have that, according to 132, we would have that x2 minus x1 equals x. Those are the numbers we supposedly chose. That's, that's what 132 allows us to show. But... But 1 minus u is greater than zero. So, this, I mean, we can see it's true, because if you just nudge x2 a little bit this way, then this will be bigger, then this will be bigger than x. So these together will be, so you can nudge x2 enough, whatever this is, so whatever you, you chose, the x is going to be that much that way. So if you just pick x2 to be a little bit more that way, then you'll have that these two are equal. It seems like a little bit... It's a little bit of a stretch to say that x2, or that 132 says that explicitly. Given any a, a is a number, and given any cut, there exists a lower number x. So a number x that's in the cut, 
and an upper number, so a number u that's not in the cut, such that u minus x equals a. So, okay, he's definitely stretching, he's definitely stretching that. What he's saying is he's adding a little bit to that because he's saying that if If we picked x1 and x2 such that x2 minus x1 equals x, then we can also pick anything bigger than x2 that will also not be in psi. That is our b, right? That if you have some rational number that's not in your cut, then and you have another number larger than that number, it's also not in the cut. So everything bigger than this, than x2, would make this bigger than... No, but this is only bigger than zero. This isn't, oof. This isn't bigger than one, this is bigger than zero. This might be a lot smaller. This, this, this could be almost nothing. And then this would consequently be We know that x2 minus x1 is x. I don't think he's actually saying anything yet because I think what he's saying is this could be anything smaller and this would still work. You could still find one. This could be anything bigger, and you could still find one. So that... Oh, I'm so dumb. Yes, always. One of my rules, I said this to you before, and then I forget it. You gotta keep it simple, stupid. I need to write that down. Keep it simple, stupid. We're not picking x2 and x1 so that x2 minus x1 equals x. This is the number that we're looking at. This could be anything. What 132 tells us is that no matter what this number is, you can find an x2 and an x1 such that x2 minus x1 equals this. This number is what is the x, not x. We're just putting the one minus u times x together to get x2 minus x1. Okay, so that's obviously true from 132 because that's the, uh, this is the number that we're saying we can subtract to one inside, one outside to equal that number. Okay, simple. <laughs> okay, turn the page. So we found the numbers x2 and x1. The only thing that we chose, we chose u less than 1. And we chose x element of psi. So we know that there is an x2 and an x1. such that x2 minus x1 equals 1 minus u x. Then we have that, he says, then we have x2 minus x1 is less than 1 minus u 
x2. And the reason for that is that we kept these the same, this side the same, but we know that uh, we know that x2 is greater than x. So this side is going to be bigger than this side. So this is bigger than this. Okay. Okay, so then he does just some, some algebra here. So he says x2 minus x1 is greater than 1 minus u x2. Then I think he distributes here x2 minus x1 is less than x2 minus u x2. That's, here's the ux2. Then he moves that over to the other side. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. What he does is adds, what he does is add both sides. He's adding ux2 to both sides. So let's, okay, so he starts here and then he adds x2, ux2 to both sides. So x2 minus x1 plus u x2 is less than 1 minus u x2 plus u x2. Okay. Then he says that this, now if you distribute this, you have x2 minus ux2. So it's equals x2 minus u x2 plus u x2. These cancel equal x2. So what do we have? Oh, and then he says that this equals x2 minus x1 plus x1 because these cancel also, right? So then we have x2 minus x1 plus x1 on the right-hand side of this, x2 minus x1 plus ux2 on the left side. So we can cancel these and we get that u x2 is less than x1. Okay. Now, he multiplies both sides by, uh, it looks like this reciprocal of u. So he has, he takes this and he multiplies, I think, yeah, he does this a little differently than I do, would because he, I would take this and multiply both sides by one over u. So one over u, u x two is less than one over u x one. Right, and that's what he has here. So then that just equals x1 over u, which is what he has here. And on this side, these just cancel, and you have x2 equals x1 divided by u. Okay, that's interesting. We're not sure where we're going, but okay, so x2 is equals x1 divided by u. He says, therefore, x1 over u is an upper number for which means, in other words, that x1 over u 
is not ink psi. And then he says something, well, this is language we've never heard before, and is not the least such. Okay, so what are we doing here? Why? What did we, what, what did we have in the last page? On the last page, we established that x2 equals x1 divided by, by u. So we, we established that x2 equals x1 over u. We know that x2 is not an element of, of psi, therefore x1 over u is not an element of psi. And he says that it's not the least such. I think the reason is that u is less than one. That was weird, my phone just ran out of storage, I had to stop. Okay, so the point here is I think that we know that u is less than one, but u is anything less than one. So that no matter what we have here, we can make Oh yeah, x1. Here's the point, because we're talking about x1 divided by, we're talking about x1 divided by u. So that means that u times x2 is less than x1. But we can always, the point is, we can always make u a little bit bigger because this is, we know that no matter what u is, we can always find another u closer to one. So just a little bit bigger. And if that's true, that means that x1 is gonna be a little bit bigger. Is that gonna work? Because then this would also be a little bit bigger. Well, maybe it's easier than that because whatever this is, there's always one. You can always be smaller. You can also also always be a little bit bigger. So what are we what are we getting at? Because we're saying that we're saying that this is always not in chi. But I think the reason is if, if, if this is not in psi, then we can always make this just a little bit bigger or a little bit, we can always make this just a little bit smaller and still not be in psi. We can make it a little smaller by making u a little bit bigger. That's the point. Because u is anything less than one, we can always make u a little bit bigger, a little closer to one. If u is a little closer, that will make this just a little bit smaller. We know, because this is a cut, that there's gonna be no least number in psi. Or, actually that is probably what he was getting at. Where was that thing about the... That thing about the least upper bound. Accepting only the least upper bound if one exists. 
X may be any X may be X may be any upper number, but then, but we said that X1 is a lower number, right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, X1 is a lower number. What I'm thinking about here is what if this landed right on the, the number that's the cut? Does that matter? I think it can't be because X1 is inside. We chose X1, we didn't choose, we found X1 to be a lower number of Xi. So X1 is inside, is inside Xi. And U is always less than one. By the way, I'm guessing that these capital letters are all, always positive, but I didn't actually read that anymore. Let me, let me verify that. Not true, okay. Okay. So, X1 is an element of Xi. That means that it's less than whatever that cutoff is. And then if we divide it, by one, by, by you, we're gonna end up on the other side. So that's all, that's all. If we have X1 here, and we divide it by this number, then we're gonna end up over here somewhere. And that's for any U. because it's gonna jump. Because this is less than you, then this will be bigger. I don't know, it's very interesting. Why can't we divide this by something very close to one? If we're dividing it by something just a tiny bit less than one, I think I'm getting confused. I think that we've already chosen the U and we're picking X1 and X2 based on that U. So the X, because X2 minus X1 equals one minus U X. So we, we, we found X2 and X1 based on the, the number U. So I think what we're saying is that actually if U were a little bigger then 
these numbers would be a little closer together in order to make them to make them true, which would make x a little bit closer and a little bit closer on the other side. I think I think that's what's going on. Uh, okay. Now, moving on, if u x1 over u equals x1, he's saying that here. I mean, that is true, isn't it? I think he's, I think it's being argumentative. I mean, if you multiplied that by u, you would have x1. Then, oh, unless, unless it's zero, right? U could be zero, I think. That doesn't make sense. He didn't say anything about that. That's why I think that U has to be positive because he didn't mention that U can't be zero. But U can't be zero here. So, okay. Then, U equals X1 divided by X1 over U equals x1 times 1 over x1 over u. Okay, all he did there was separate it, right? It's this divided by this, so that's this divided by this. Okay. Here, x1 is a lower number for Xi, meaning that it's uh, an element of Xi. We already, we already said that. And 1 over X1 over U is a lower number for Nu. Why? <laughs> Where'd we get that? Did we define new? X1 is a lower number for Xi and one over x1 over u is a lower number for nu. I think he's just defining this to say, let this be a lower number for nu. And then what he's saying is that no matter what, because then this is one thing times another thing. So this, we started with this being an element of alpha or of Xi, and this define nu as elements of this form, basing them on, on uh, one, on X1. And we just showed that that equals U, and the U is an element of one star. Hence, u is a lower number for xi nu. Oh, that, oh, 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 okay, that's, sorry, that's just because x1 is an element of xi, uh, xi. Uh, one over x1 over u is an element of nu, right? So this, by definition, is an element of psi nu, right? So that means that u, which is an element of one, is an element of psi nu. Okay, that worked. Um, I believe that. I'm going to stop now and think about it, and I think I might rewrite this now sort of more quickly so we can follow it. But I don't, and I'm not entirely clear about this. I want to think about this a little more. But this, the important thing here is that this has absolute, this is not remotely the way that 
Rudin proved addition. So this is a completely different way of looking at this than we looked at it. Because when we were doing addition, we had our alpha. And then we used the Archimedean property to say that for any v greater than 1, or was it for any v less than 1, we defined w equals minus v over 2, and that then there was some uh, n w here such that n plus 1 w was outside, and then n plus 2 w was even more outside. And then we said that if this was the element of that p equals minus n plus 2 w is an element of beta. That's what we had to prove to show that, that then if we start with v, we can show that alpha beta, that, that v is also in alpha beta. So we use the, the Archimedean property here to find a w so that n w is inside, n plus 1 w is outside, n plus 2 w is even more, and then we defined p minus p minus w to be outside, which would be, you know, minus p minus w, and we're still outside. That's not remotely what we did here. What we did here is a lot more logical, I think, and, and less algebraic in how it's done. So it's definitely not the same, which is what I wanted to verify, that I wasn't crazy, that by what Rudin claimed was that that proofs of multiplication are virtually identical to the proofs of addition. I tried doing that and I kept getting stuck because I needed to use square roots. And so we're looking at this to see whether there was a way to do it Rudin's way that didn't uh, use square roots. And the answer is, at least from what this says, no, that's not the way to do it at all. Even the book that he used, Landau didn't do it this way at all. Landau had an entirely different way of looking at them. So I'll look at this some more, and I think I might write up the proof again more quickly. But thank you for watching. Uh, that was interesting. I think we've proved it now, and we're ready to move on to step six. Thank you. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.